get started. I'm Brianne Rosner. I'm the Gallery and Craft Fair Director at Peters Valley. So I am your host for the last weekend of our virtual um, weekly artist presentations. We've really enjoyed them and are, uh, it's been so wonderful that, you know, everybody can join us from wherever you are. We've got California, we've got Idaho, Missouri, Mexico, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Um, it's really wonderful that we can all come together and share our love of craft and uh, appreciate artists and support them. So thank you again for joining us tonight. We've got just a few presentations. So hopefully you can all uh, tune in the entire time. None will be missed. And we're going to start off with Pat Pauly. Pat is a sought after lecturer and teacher in contemporary fiber arts. Pat shares her wealth of knowledge from decades of working in design. Recognized nationally and internationally, her work evokes natural forms that are bold and graphic. Her award-winning art quilts have been featured in numerous publications and exhibitions. Her workshops focus on design and technique, as well as when to apply the rules and when to toss them out. Pat Pauly Studio is in Rochester, New York. Welcome, Pat. Well, thank you. I'm going to share my screen, and let's hope I can find it here. Um, and I'd love to walk you through some of my work. Let's see how quick I can do this. Um, right from the beginning. Okay, here we go. From the beginning. Oh, good. It's here. So um, it's supposed to be a 10 minute talk. So let's see if I can do it. Everybody's got their seat, although some I see have beautiful sunsets. That's the me, as you see, that's a little portrait I did for a, a challenge last year. I hail, uh, I, I travel all over the world and um, here I am in the flesh uh, teaching, but I'm, I'm the, in, from the home of Susan B. Anthony in Rochester, New York, not New York City, which you know is very far away, but New York did give me a big billboard once, which I caught online, so it's kind of fun. I write a blog every single day, you can go find it, and last night it was your turn to be highlighted. I print a lot of fabric and uh, you can see there's my studio with on a long piece of stenciled thing. Sometimes I use things from nature or not nature. Uh, and you can see I've used it here in this piece. Uh, these are uh, fiber, these are quilts, if you want to call them that. I'm auditioning some fabric that I've now put into a large piece here. You get some idea of how large these are. Um, I do love to quilt my drawing, let's say, and it's just tons of fun to do that quilting. So I've actually got them hanging. <laughs> this is for anything goes over your couch. You don't have to say, oh, contemporary art doesn't work. I've worked on a piece here and I'll just give you an idea of how I put it together. I audition some fabrics, see if they're going to work or not. I've got an idea in my head I want to try out and it has to do with botanical pieces. So it starts to emerge and I've got them in pieces on my cutting table. And finally, they all go together. And this piece looks just fine in my house, <laughs> but um, it looks a lot better when it's in an exhibition. So I was lucky enough to be able to include it in that. So you have an idea of how large these pieces are. I make a lot of fabric and here's a piece that I've offered on my website. So you can go and see them, if for no other reason, just to see how I make them. Um, I have all kinds of, I call them prints, but I cut them up and I suggest that people do as well. Um, I did a project when we were under lockdown and it was, there's my little house, and it was to po a, tie a piece of fabric up on my tree outside every single day. And um, this little, video went through about three months and I've continued it. This was March when it was uh, snowing and I've continued it. So now I've had, I think over 200 pieces that have gone up on the tree and I changed them and people seem to like it. So um, it's been a, sort of my way of expressing this feeling that we all have of being locked there. And this is what I'm doing inside this little house where my studio is and I'm printing fabric. So um, you have some idea of what that, that is like. I wanna make sure this keeps going. Let's see, keep going. 
Um, I want to get to the next slide. So I do print on uh, cotton. Uh, I also use silk, but for the works that I make and hang, they're cotton. And here I am monoprinting. Um, and I've done more monoprinting. I'm printing right off of my table. I'm using thickened dyes, uh, so fiber reactive dyes that will not wash out. <laughs> Obviously, it will take to snow and rain. And I've uh, got various methods, rubbings and painting and all kinds of ways to um, print on this fabric. I thought it would be fun to see this little video. Uh, I'm printing what I call, I print the table. So I'm screen printing right to my plastic uh, table that's a padded table. And I'm using that thickened dye. And if I print to the table, I can mess it up with my fingers and um, incise uh, lines to it. And then I can take my fabric and um, uh, add some pressure to it to, uh, to make a print, a mono print here, one of a kind. And I've already got um, soda ash in my fabric. So I'm going to pull this print and then I will go back and add into it um, here. You'll see what I get. It's kind of a cool method, I think, uh, for printing. Um, and now I'm going to just drop in some color with a scraper. Uh, again with thick and dye. I don't really paint <laughs> um, on fabric and I the tools I use are very basic um, and I teach how to do this. I have classes in uh, printing as well as um, classes in design. So you have an idea of how these these are made. It's, it's really oh, it's really fun to do. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, I think I want to get past this screen. Let's get to the next. Let's see if I can go. So here I am over in um, Pro Chemical and Dye, which is in Fall River, Mass, with a class of, I think, 15 people, and we're printing like crazy. Um, but sometimes I hop in a plane, even a little one, and I am off to uh, Coopville, Washington, on the coast, where we're printing. But now that the lockdown has happened, I'm printing virtually. So I'm looking at someone in their studio. She happens to be in France. Um, and my studio is on the right. Uh, so I'm studio to studio now. I am in their studio, they're in mine, and we're printing live, uh, live five hours a day for five days in a row. It's a ton of fun. And I also have classes uh, in design. I started a series where I take two pieces of fabric and I, it helps to have great fabric and I combine them. So those two pieces became this quilt, which you see here for scale. And uh, this piece I put together with this piece and this became that, which is, I think the last place it traveled was Taiwan. So I think it's coming home eventually. Another piece that's just two pieces of fabric and another. So I teach this class of just taking two pieces of fabric and composing with that. This is another two piece um, quilt. And here they are lined up. They're all 40 inches square. They look better in an exhibition though. It was a lot of fun to do that. And there it is uh, up close. This is once in a blue moon and it wasn't an exhibition. So you have an idea of how it looks. This is another one called Chinese marbles and that was also in an exhibition. So it's kind of fun to have these go out. These are two pieces I used uh, to make this quilt, which is based on a nine patch and it was allowed into uh, Quilt National last a year, two years ago, I guess now. And there I am very proudly <laughs> standing in front of it. And for the most part, not everybody is really thrilled to see it. They're looking at someone else's. The largest piece I ever did is 24 feet wide and 12 feet high, and it was meant to hang outdoors. And you have me for scale there. It went to uh, Memphis last year for a show um, and it was, that was a real treat to be uh, featured there. Um, apparently it was very popular for prom dates. Another piece that I made with my own hand dyed, hand printed works, you see for scale here is in my house, but better in an exhibition. This is another Quilt National. I love leaves. I've used botanical images. Here's my assistant for scale. <laughs> and this leaf was the one that started off a whole series of pink leaves. You can see I've started to put it together improvisationally, meaning I don't have a pattern or a drawing or sketch, and you have an idea of how large it is. Um, this one I'm up in the Adirondacks finishing, and it's now in a 
bank, I guess, they purchased it. I'm always happy for that. This is another piece I made from a photograph, and you see how large it is for scale. I've been published lots of times and on the cover of German magazines and Italian magazines. Um, this is a pretty big piece. It's about eight feet wide, and you don't know that until you see it really in an exhibition. Um, so it's kind of fun. The largest one I ever did was 11 feet tall. That's this one that's hanging over a Stephen Merritt mantle, hand-built uh, fireplace for those people who know Stephen Merritt's work. I love being in exhibitions where I get to talk about my work and um, I have a whole series devoted to that. I teach classes all over. These people are in California. I was lucky enough to travel to um, Australia. This is Bondi Beach and um, the Three Sisters before they all went up in flames. I can't show you those quilts. They're off to an exhibition where I'm hoping to get in. But I'll leave you with this one, which was last year's piece in a show locally. And this one, which is right behind me, that you can see if you're looking at me in the little screen. I want to thank you for letting me be here tonight. It's a real treat. And thank I you, Sarah. Your work is gorgeous. And, oh, thank you. and there's my piece so behind me. So, That's awesome. yeah. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, our next presenter is Kathleen Lang, May, Texas. She had a last minute conflict and is unable to join us tonight, but she's left us this fantastic video. So I will play that in a moment, but let me tell you more about her. Kathleen has been instructing and creating in the mediums of printmaking, paper, and book arts for over 15 years. She discovered eco printing about four years ago and has additionally been investigating the process involved with printing on fabric and paper without ink using only the dye from botanicals and metal. She has held classes and workshops in various venues, including the Printmaking Center of New Jersey, Arts Council of Princeton, Grounds for Sculpture, and the Hunterdon Art Museum. During the past year, Kathleen has won awards for her eco-printing work. So let me share with you this video, and uh, we can learn more about her. I've always surrounded myself with nature. Being outside in the wild makes me feel happier, invigorated. I feel free. In every spare moment, I'm drawn to the water, the woods, or the air. As I explore, I find what nature has left behind for me. Leaves, berries, and metals all left behind that the earth is slowly taking back. It's all so beautiful but there is much more than meets the eye. Organic Imprint Studio is a convergence of all aspects of my artistic self. The process makes me feel at peace. I gather materials while experiencing the outdoors, use them to compose designs, and employ natural, sustainable chemistry to expose their hidden colors and textures. When the process is complete, I return the materials to the earth in the most sustainable fashion. Nature is full of surprises. I like the idea that it's random in some sense, never really repeatable. I can reproduce the process, material, the design, and try to make everything identical, but it never is. No two scarves are the same and never will be. Nature ensures that. I never get tired of unraveling the scarf and seeing what nature has in store for me. The composition, patterns, and tones ingrained in the fabric are fascinating, but it's really nature that draws one in. The natural and unexpected colors and gradients are a reminder that we all fall for nature's beauty. When I wrap myself in a scarf, I'm humbled by nature's elemental masterpiece. Imbued with Earth's pigment, the caress of the fabric completes me as I venture out into the wild in search of the brush and palette nature left for me to discover.
to get it at a full screen. Okay. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that video. Oh, I think it's still playing. Bear with me one second. Um, if you would like to meet Kathleen in, in virtual person, um, she will be one of our exhibiting artists at our 50th annual Peters Valley Craft Fair Reimagined, which will be online October 10th and 11th. So you can find more information on our website and we've got a lot of wonderful artists, including Kathleen. So we hope that you will join us for that. Our next presenter is Jesse Burt. Jesse is a Mexico-based artist. He holds a BFA in jewelry and metal smithing from RIT and an MFA in jewelry and metal smithing from ECU. Three years spent as an apprentice in a tool and dye shop before beginning university gave Jesse a strong interest and appreciation for fine handmade tools, which he now uses to embellish his work with delicate texture and design. Over the past 12 years, he has taught metal smithing and jewelry techniques to students of all skill levels at his own studio in San Miguel de Allende, and as well as annual workshops in other cities around the world. Jesse is an adjunct professor at the Technological Institute of Monterey in Guadalajara. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Thanks, Brianne. Uh, just wanted to say thanks for uh, inviting me to be here this evening and, and share with you all what I can. And um, thanks to, to Peters Valley again for making this all possible. And thanks to everyone that, that is here uh, tuning in. So I am going to um, do a share screen and uh, just give you guys a little uh, show of images of what I have been doing since uh, about February, I guess. And here we go. So uh, let's see, share. All right. And great. Okay, so um, this is, I'm going to start my timer, make sure I don't go over. This is my studio. This is a shot of the, the bench where I usually work in uh, my studio in San Miguel de Allende, which is in the central highlands of Mexico. Uh, I live at about 6,700 feet. So it's, um, it's pretty much high desert. And this is a sweet little spot. I have a lot of good light. And so um, just for any of you that may not have the information or may not know, I am, uh, I work with a lot of found and recycled materials as well as making tools. Um, so this is just a, a piece. This is a necklace piece that uh, combines a lot of different elements. And um, so the, some of the parts, uh, I don't know how that works, but um, there's, there's parts that are cast. Uh, some of the bale sections are cast in uh, sterling silver with sand casting. And then um, I like to use a lot of also local materials whenever possible. So one of the things that this piece, particular piece has is coconut shell. So the, the main body of the piece is carved from some coconut shell. And um, that uh, the image on the left, the little uh, bronze flower looking piece is, um, it's actually Shibuichi. So it's 85% uh, uh, copper and 15% pure silver mix. So that's a, uh, and then a lot of the stamping, especially on the back side of this piece, is again uh, made with with tools that that I make. Um, so here's another piece. This is I call it uh, my COVID compass, and, and it's a a piece that uh, came about actually um, before the whole lockdown thing started, but. Uh, some of the inspiration for this piece came from ceramics and some antique furniture. And um, so it's a mixture of, again, some casting. Uh, the central body is copper and some, uh, some silver elements, bronze. Uh, the, the image on the right-hand side has uh, the center section that is kind of that band 
ice carved from local wood. Uh, it's Dodonea viscosa, which is uh, commonly called Ocotillo where I live. And then it has some inlay of ebony and uh, maple. And you see the, just the back side of this. So this is, it's actually, it was a lot of fun to make and it's probably one of the, the most, um, I would say the most complex uh, mechanically pieces that I've made to date, which was pretty fun. And um, just a lot of different elements. I like, I love making little latches and things as well. So this has a nice little catch mechanism. And then the, in the central kind of window area is uh, a piece of red obsidian that came from one of the, I found it um, in the, just in the countryside where I live and came from one of my first little walks in the, the area during the COVID uh, lockdown. Here on the right hand side uh, is me working in my studio doing some um, hammer making. So that's kind of um, after some of the, the grinding uh, has been done and I'm opening the, the central hole in the middle of the hammer head. Uh, here's a little bit more. Uh, here on the left you can see I am working at the anvil and again just doing a little shaping and tweaking. So I make um, uh, I guess for about, I think it's been about since night, uh, from 2010, I started doing quite a bit more um, making of hammers. And so the, the handles are turned from local wood. All of the handles that you see in the uh, right hand picture here are turned from uh, Mexican oak. So that's uh, nice to be able to have ready access to. And then the, the heads are made from from tool steel, it's a, um, um, and then uh, the the faces are hardened, so they last a really long time. Here is some uh, some fun chasing hammers that are commissions, and that's another thing, another part of what I've been doing during the the whole uh, spring and summertime. Uh, two different shapes of of chasing hammers. Here's a little bit more of those two hammers. The one on the left is designed and sort of mimicked after a group of hammers that I was able to have access to in the archives of the uh, Escuela Masana in uh, Barcelona. Um, it was a, a group of hammers that, that students were once required to make as their entrance to the, the university. So it was just some inspiration there. And then a little bit more classic shape on the right of a bigger chasing hammer. And uh, that same uh, kind of bigger chasing hammer on the left. And then on the right um, is a commission I just finished, which is a different type of hammer that I also make that is made from horn. And horn hammers are uh, a little bit more like uh, what a rawhide hammer would be. When I uh, first moved to Mexico, a friend that was a, a jeweler, um, kind of uh, briefed me on the traditional use of horn as a forming type of hammer in Mexico. And uh, so I've started to, to make them again. So this is a really nice example that uh, just went off to a client in Hawaii. And it's a horn, Mexican cow horn and uh, Hollywood. And the Hollywood, I actually just uh, been with my parents for a little while in Pennsylvania and the holly is Pennsylvania holly. So that, that piece is just, uh, just finished up. So um, please uh, have a look at my website if you like, uh, or if you use Instagram and would like to find out more about me, uh, have a look at my Instagram. Um, and uh, there you have it. That's just a little bit about what I've been doing. Thank you, Jesse. And for those of you that wanna hear more about Jesse's teaching experiences, um, we are having a panel discussion around our Making Matters exhibition, and that will be on Thursday at 2 p.m. So you can find all of the virtual programming that we're doing for the week in our weekly newsletter or on the events page on our website. And we'll next be joined by Miriam Jacobs, another fiber artist. So it's a treat to have so many different kinds of fiber artists uh, tonight. As a college art student, Miriam Jacobs concentrated on figure drawing, experimental film animation, and sculpture. Years later, she stumbled upon surface design, which has come to occupy center stage. 
The technique she has explored most thoroughly is dispersed dye and has had two of her pieces published in, in a book about fabric art. She began to teach art, dispersed dye, and other surface design methods in a variety of settings, including to teens and adults with special needs. Miriam became a certified art teacher and continues to exhibit her fine art, sometimes presenting her dispersed dye work as fine art. Hey, Miriam. Okay, hi. Hi everyone, um, I decided to pull out the book that um, I had two pieces published in and this is, this is um, one of the pieces. And in fact, I did it while I was taking a workshop up at Peters Valley. So uh, sort of full circle coming around. So I'm gonna share my screen. And where did, I, hold on. Okay, um, now I have to share the screen again, right? Share screen, sorry about that everybody. Hold on, do share. Here we go, I think. Okay, I have to move this window to get the share screen up. It is not wanting to do this. I see your screen, Miriam. Um, I just have to, here, I have to get that button, okay. Yeah, the green button. Okay, so um, here's the green button. My name is Miriam Perfect. Jacobs, and is this good? Everyone can see now? Yep, it's perfect. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about one of the things that I do, um, which is called dispersed dye. It's sort of a hybrid of painting and printmaking. It's painting in that I work on paper with um, fabric dyes that I mix myself and fabric crayons, which uh, you could buy commercially and you can also make your own crayons so that you're not limited to the eight colors that you can buy. So you're working on paper in many different layers of color application. And when you have, uh, when, when you're ready to print, you put your paper in a hot press with um, fabric, close up the hot press, and then the heat lifts the color off the paper and onto the fabric. And that's um, how you guess, I guess you could call, say that I'm a fiber artist, but the uh, fabric is polyester. It's not really that important to the process, actually, um, except for the fact that that's the only kind of fabric that will take the dispersed dye. Um, and working on polyester is, has always been sort of strange, being a child of the 60s and being in love with cotton. So it's a little odd to be working with polyester. In any event, um, uh, I was looking to print, figure out how to print on polyester because I was making some uh, religious objects and I needed it to be on synthetic fabric. That's how this all started. Um, it's a long story, which I can't, don't have time to share here, but that's, that's how it happened. Um, so I will move up to um, one of the pieces, one of my very, very old and early pieces when I was doing dispersed dye as a printmaking medium uh, where I would make large um, pieces. You can see this; these three pieces were from the same large piece of paper and then other ones were other large pieces and then I collaged them together. So this is what I was doing for a while and that's where the piece in the book um, was from as well during that time. Um, somewhere along the line, I fell in love with this um, graphic from South Africa. Um, the colors are not the original colors from that mural in South Africa. Those are my colors, but the design is. This is eight feet by 10 feet, and I had to make a map so that I could know how to print it on my printing press because my print, printing press is, is significantly smaller than this piece. Um, this is actually the second print. Um, you can um, do ghost prints with uh, uh, dispersed dye. 
uh, which I really love doing because then you can layer pieces that are very bright with pieces that are more muted. And you'll see a little bit more of this a little bit later. Um, excuse me. Um, at some point, I started using dispersed dye um, to make prints for onto neckties. And you can see the three ties on the left were some of my older ties. Um, it, and you can see that I made a lot of different paintings um, and then collaged them together. But that was taking forever and ever and ever. And though I really loved them, it, um, I was hoping to use these ties uh, as my day job and uh, so that I could get to my, back to my fine art. Things didn't quite work out that way, but I started looking to simplify the process. So these four pieces you can see um, are not pieced together as collages, they're one piece. Um, I sold uh, and made many, 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 many ties. And anyone who knows me probably has one in their closet. Um, when I started doing shows with dispersed dye and some other of my art, people started asking about the method and I, I started bringing examples of papers to the shows to show, try to explain to people how this is, is done. And then I started piecing together the papers themselves once they've been printed um, into collages uh, because it was surprising to me how much color stayed on the papers after being printed. So these are um, an example of small collages. These are other examples of some collages that I did with the papers that already had been printed. And when I put this slide together, I was sort of laughing at myself because it's so, there's so much brown here. And I hated, absolutely hated brown when I was a little kid. I would pretty much never touch it. And here I am as an adult, um, getting off on brown like crazy. This is an example of some uh, collaging that I did. These, these are first run papers. These, this is sort of my uh, comfort zone colors, oranges and greens and yellows and reds. Um, and I tried to start to push myself out of my comfort zone a little bit and use colors that were not in my comfort zone, like these blues and especially the pink. Um, this is a collage that I did a few weeks ago during this COVID insanity. Um, it's uh, first run and second run papers. And here's another piece with first run and second run papers. Um, I did this one actually at the Peters Valley Craft Show last September when I was doing uh, demonstrations of dispersed dye for both days of the fair and uh, ended up really liking this piece, even though it was done very, very, very quickly. This is a, another piece that I did during the COVID craziness, uh, where I'm trying to push myself out of my um, um, stripes um, and vertical lines, trying to experiment with some composition um, and also with color. This is my last slide, where again, I am trying to um, get myself out of the vertical composition and also to, especially with the one on the left that I'm calling learning to be quiet, um, try to use a little more, get a little lighter. And, and I think that's also part of this whole re response to the COVID times, just wanting not to be so in your face and bold and light. And the other one, made me think of hallelujah with the arms up. And I see Brienne has come back onto the screen, which no, means- No, I put it on too early. You can say a few more things if you, if you have things to say. <laughs> okay, well, um, I always have more to say. Um, I, I do teach this method and um, I haven't taught it virtually, but um, I teach this method and other surface design methods as well. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to work large again and get back to more to using dispersed dye, not so much for commercial purposes, but as a printmaking um, medium. So I think that's, that'll be, that'll be it for now. <laughs> well, thank you, Miriam. I love how you were using the papers. You know, you didn't want to just throw them away after you died um, on uh, that. 
thank you. I have I have lots of papers to make collages with. <laughs> awesome, cool. Well, thank you so much. And since it is a kind of short week and it is the last of these wonderful presentations, we thought that we would play for you a really special video. Some of you may have already seen it, um, but it's worth a watch again. Last summer, the really talented filmmaker Christopher King came onto our campus to try to capture what is the magic of Peters Valley, and he did an incredible job. So we wanted to play it all for you um, so that we can all remember how special of a place it is and hope that we'll be back here again soon and that um, even though we can't be there now, we're doing so many great things virtually and we hope that you'll continue to support us and participate in everything we have to offer. So let me share with you. Coming to a place like this, you're free to think. Like, what if, what if, oh, what if? And then to actually pursue it. Within my realm, my kingdom, you're free to kick some boxes around, you know, and you're free to make a mess of things and go wherever you want. I might borrow an idea from the form of a tree. I might borrow an idea from the surface of a swing set that's frozen in the winter time to get that little layer of frost on it. And I might even name it here. Yeah, because I know that I can take that somewhere. If I go into the jeweler's studio and the fine metal studio and fully immerse myself there for a week, I might be thinking of myself as a metalsmith for the week and maybe that changes something about how I work, how I approach material. That's why those kinds of opportunities are really interesting and really important because those do give us the opportunity to go outside of our, our materials and in doing that go outside of our comfort zones. That's the key, you know, get that all cooking. So if they're open enough to the experience, yeah, they can they can totally undermine who they were and open their head to who they could be. You start to flip the different abilities of materials to talk about different human emotion, constructs of relationships, our viewpoint on the world. Felt can talk about warmth. Steel can talk about warmth also. We bring in experts in the field, artists that come from all over the country and all over the world. We run these immersive workshops where people come and specifically focus on learning skills or concepts or learning to work with materials or certain tools or certain ways of forming. They learn about different aesthetics. It's time in the saddle. That's what it is. You have to be connected to the material. You have to know how it works, how it reacts, and how it's gonna finish. Everything here doesn't have to be high level and expert. We do beginner stuff. And some people just have never taken a, a woodworking class or a jewelry class, and they think it'll be fun. This is where people do that. At Peter's Valley, they make work that they've never made before. This is a historic Panagama, one of the first built in the United States for educational purposes. It's a single chamber kiln. It takes full advantage of work being in close proximity to the fire and the timber beds. Someone who might be making tall jars, somebody's making very delicate little figures, large figures working with different clays, different forms, when they get set out to be loaded, 
they have to be orchestrated into the kiln in a way that will benefit that flow of the fire and the heat moving through. It can be stunningly beautiful and it can give you surfaces that you really can't get any other way. It's like magic. And that tool allows for artists to come at it from as many different perspectives as there are artists. I love that. God, that's where invention comes from, is if we keep our minds open to hearing what other people have to say, <laughs> too. People move heaven and earth to be here. And then at the end of the week or the experience, they're walking out going, home. Oh, wow. And they start to latch onto some pearls that they didn't have previously. Somewhere along the line, there's going to come a piece that, that really sings about you. And that is just delicious. <laughs> you know, it's like if you could just hang on to that. It's just the best. Hope you all enjoyed that. Um, it's weird after watching that video to put on a screen of just me. So I encourage you all to put your videos back on and um, you can say hello and goodbye for a few more minutes. I hope you really enjoyed that and that you will stay tuned to um, our other programming. Oh, I've got another video starting again. So you can, you can unmute yourselves if anybody wants to say anything, any fun, special yeah. memories about Peter's Valley. Series. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> I can't seem to unmute. Uh, uh, start my video. You've got me locked. Uh, Pat Pauly. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. This is a real treat. <laughs> Thanks. Brienne? Brienne? Yes. Hi, Susan. You know, 48 years ago, I was giving tours for the Park Service at Peters Valley. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so many of the things weren't here. I, I wish all of this stuff had been going on then, but it was, it was pretty exciting. For those of you that don't know Susan, her mother, Sally DeFrancisco, was the first executive director of Peters Valley, and the exhibition gallery is named in her honor. <laughs> okay. Can you say goodbye? I have, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a memory of, of taking a class at Peters Valley and walking up from the uh, place where we had fantastic, mostly vegetarian food. Um, and we're walking back up to the fiber place and someone thought that they saw a bear. And we, I was with three other women students and two of them started running like crazy. One of them started making noise and I ended up crouching down um, to try to like hide, to hide myself, looking around to see if I could see the bear because I was so excited to see it. And uh, we never saw it, but we were all laughing like crazy at all our different responses when we got back to the studio. That's anyway, so that's when Holly Heller Ramsey was teaching something there. Long time ago. Brienne. Uh, Beth. Brienne, I have a bear story from last year. Oh. There. <laughs> After dinner, we were all going up to Thunder Mountain to go and make some more work in the special topics studio. And there was an enormous bear right smack in the middle of the road on the way. Oh. And I stopped and there was somebody behind me. And I felt like such a wuss that I was like, I'm not going to go past this bear. It's going to eat me. And um, it turns out that the person behind me was in a jeep that had no windows and and just canvas for the roof and she was so happy we were in front of her so that the bear didn't go after her <laughs> wow <laughs> that's 
So I just want to say, I started coming to Peter's Valley, I, I think I was like 20 or like er, very, very young. And I'm in my 60s now. And I still, still go to Peter's Valley. And um, I couldn't help thinking about Mitch Lyons, like seeing some of the work that was shown tonight because I met him at Peter's Valley and he changed, really changed my life. Like I became very close to him and I assisted him at Haystack. And, um, and I met one of my best friends in life at Peter's Valley in a, in a, in a class. And sh we still, we, she lives, has a second home near Peter's Valley. Jen, you know who I'm talking about. I do. And like we, we, hang out and we do artwork together and we look every year what class could we take at Peter's Valley and I just you know when I was there like all through the years there were times when we thought it would never survive and um <laughs> and, I, and I have to say it's just such a joy to these thank these you Kristen fabulous and it's just great so thank you it's funny because I'm sitting here putting um together a mailing for our 50th uh, anniversary show. That Great. I have uh, to say that I'm not a big fan of Zoom, but this is the only Zoom meeting that I've done religiously. We never missed one. Wow. And I'm going to be so sad that this is the last one. What are we going to do now? What are we going to do yeah. now? We're in the team. We have two more Zooms this week on Wednesday. Um, Dominique Ellis is giving a lecture on Wednesday. Yes. And hey. then a panel discussion on Thursday. I love her. And then I think we, I don't know what else we have. Then we're getting ready <laughs> for our virtual craft fair, which is going to be awesome. Okay. So, so I'm going to have a booth there. Me too. <laughs> Lisa's going to have up this week. Yeah. So it's gonna, I, I'm really excited about that. And um, we've got some workshops that are starting to roll out. So we, we keep going, you know, we're not letting COVID stop us from continuing to make things. So, um, well, thank you all for joining us tonight. And You're welcome. Thank you. Much. It was Bye. terrific. Thank you. Uh, Take care, Thanks everybody. So Be safe. Take care. Good to see Bye. you. Bye. Be creative. Bye, Jen. Hi, Lisa.